The Cybrarian Presents. Robert E. Howard's Call the Conqueror The Shadow Kingdom Disclaimer, the following may contain violence, references to sex, and language that may offend. Music by Solar Flare. Images by Alex Holyoke, Anna Roswodowska, Ben Guerin, and Eberhard Grosskastiger. Chapter 3 They That Walk the Night The moon had not risen when Cull, hand to hilt, stepped to a window. The windows opened upon the great inner gardens of the royal palace, and breezes of the night, bearing the scents of spice trees, blew the filmy curtains about. The king looked out. The walks and groves were deserted, carefully trimmed trees were bulky shadows. Fountains nearby flung their slender sheen of silver in the starlight, and distant fountains rippled steadily. No guards walked those gardens, for so closely were the outer walls guarded that it seemed impossible for any invader to gain access to them. Vines curled up the walls of the palace, and even as Cull mused upon the ease with which they might be climbed, a segment of shadow detached itself from the darkness below the window, and a bare brown arm curved up over the sill. Cull's great sword hissed halfway from the sheath. Then the king halted. Upon the muscular forearm gleamed the dragon amulet shown him by Kanu the night before. The possessor of the arm pulled himself up over the sill and into the room, with the swift, easy motion of a climbing leopard. You are Brul? asked Cull, and then stopped in surprise, not unmingled with an annoyance and suspicion, for the man was he whom Cull had taunted in the Hall of Society the same who had escorted him from the Pictish embassy. I am Brul, the Spear Slayer, answered the Pict in a guarded voice, and then swiftly, gazing closely at Cull's face, he said, barely above a whisper, Kanama Kalajirama. Cull started. Huh? What mean you? You know not. Nay, the words are unfamiliar. They are of no language I ever heard. And yet, by Balka. Somewhere I have heard. I was the Pict's only comment. His eyes swept the room, the study room of the palace. Except for a few tables, a divan or two, and great shelves of books or parchment, the room was barren compared to the grandeur of the rest of the palace. Tell me, King, who guards the door? Eighteen of the Red Slayers. But how come you, stealing through the gardens by night, scaling the walls of the palace? Brill sneered. Huh. The guards of Volusia are blind buffaloes. I could steal their girdles from under their noses. I stole amid them, and they saw me not, nor heard me. And the walls? I could scale them without the aid of vines. I have hunted tigers on the foggy beaches where the sharp east breezes blew the mists in from seaward, and I have climbed the steeps of the western sea mountain. But come, nay, touch this armlet. He held out his arm and, as Cull complied wonderingly, gave an apparent sigh of relief. <sighs> so, now throw off those kingly robes, for there are ahead of you this night such deeds no Atlantean ever dreamed of. Brill himself was clad only in a scanty loincloth, through which was thrust a short, curved sword. And who are you to give me orders? asked Cull. Slightly resentful. Did not Kanu bid you follow me in all things? Asked the pick irritably, his eyes flashing momentarily. I have no love for you, Lord, but for the moment I have put the thought of feuds from my mind. Do you likewise? But come. Walking noiselessly, he led the way across the room to the door. A slide on the door allowed a view to the outer corridor. Unseen from without, 
the pecked bait cull look. What see you? Not but the eighteen guardsmen. The peck nodded, motioned Cull to follow him across the room. At a panel in the opposite wall, Brill stopped and fumbled there a moment. Then, with a light movement, he stepped back, drawing his sword as he did so. Cull gave an exclamation as the panel swung silently open, revealing a dimly lighted passageway. A secret passage, swore Cull softly, and I knew nothing of it. By Vodka, someone shall dance for this. Silence, hissed the pick. Brill was standing like a bronze statue, as if straining every nerve for the slightest sound. Something about his attitude made Cull's hair prickle slightly. Not from fear, but from some eerie anticipation. Then beckoning, Brill stepped through the secret doorway which stood open behind them. The passage was bare, but not dust-covered, as should have been the case with an unused secret corridor. A vague grey light filtered through somewhere, but the source of it was not apparent. Every few feet, Cull saw doors, invisible, as he knew, from the outside, but easily apparent from within. This palace is a very honeycomb, he muttered. Aye, night and day you are watched, king, by many eyes. The king was impressed by Brill's manner. The pick went forward slowly, warily, half crouching, blade held low and thrust forward. When he spoke it was in a whisper and he continually flung glances from side to side. The corridor turned sharply and Brill warily gazed past the turn. Look, he whispered, but remember, no word, no sound on your life. The corridor changed just at a bend to a flight of steps, and then Cull recoiled. At the foot of those stairs lay the eighteen red slayers who were that night stationed to watch the king's study room. Brule's grip upon his mighty arm and Brule's fierce whisper as his shoulder alone kept Cull from leaping down those stairs. Silent, Cull, silent. In Valka's name, hissed the pick. These corridors are empty now, but I risk much in showing you that you might then believe what I had to say. Back now to the room of study. And he retraced his steps, Cull following, his mind in a turmoil of bewilderment. This is treachery, muttered the king, his steel grey eyes a smolder. Foul and swift, mere minutes have passed since those men stood at guard. Again in the room of study, Brill carefully closed the secret panel and motioned Cull to look again through the slit of the outer door. Cull gasped audibly, for without stood the eighteen guardsmen. This is sorcery, he whispered, half drawing his sword. Do dead men guard the king? Aye, came Brill's scarcely audible reply. There was a strange expression in the pick's scintillant eyes. They looked squarely into each other's eyes for an instant. Cull's brow wrinkled in a puzzled scowl as he strove to read the pick's inscrutable face. Then Brill's lips, barely moving, formed the words. The snake that speaks. Silent, whispered Cull, laying his hand over Brill's mouth. That is death to speak. That name is accursed. The Pict's fearless eyes regarded him steadily. Look again, King Cull. Perchance the guard was changed. Nay, those are the same men. In Valka's name, this is sorcery. This is insanity. I saw with my own eyes the bodies of those men. Not eighteen minutes are gone, yet there they stand. Brill stepped back, away from the door, Cull mechanically following. Cull, what know ye of the traditions of this race ye rule? Much, and yet little. Volusia is so old, aye. Brill's eyes lighted strangely. We are but barbarians, infants compared to the seven empires. Not even they themselves know how old they are. Neither the memory of man nor the annals of the historians reach back far enough to tell us when the first men came up from the sea and built cities on the shore. But Cull, men were not always ruled by men. The king started, their eyes met. Aye, there is a legend of my people and mine, broke in Bro. That was before we of the Isles were allied with Volusia. Aye. In the reign of the Lion Fang, seventh war chief of the Picts, so many years ago no man remembers how many. Across the sea we came, from the Isles of the Sunset, skirting the shores of Atlantis and falling upon the beaches of Volusia with fire and sword. Aye, 
The long white beaches resounded with the clash of spears, and the night was like day from the flame of the burning castles. And the king, the king of Valusia, who died on the Red Sea sands that dim day. His voice trailed off. The two stared at each other, neither speaking. Then each nodded. Ancient is Valusia, whispered Cull. The hills of Atlantis and Mu were isles of the sea when Valusia was young. The night breeze whispered through the open window. Not the free, crisp sea air such as Brule and Cull knew and reveled in, in their land, but a breath like a whisper from the past. Laden with musk, scents of forgotten things, breathing secrets that were hoary when the world was young. The tapestries rustled, and suddenly Cull felt like a naked child before the inscrutable wisdom of the mystic past. Again the sense of unreality swept upon him. At the back of his soul stole dim, gigantic phantoms, whispering monstrous things. He sensed that Brule experienced similar thoughts. The Pict's eyes were fixed upon his face with a fierce intensity. Their glances met. Cull felt warmly a sense of comradeship with this member of an enemy tribe. Like rival leopards turning at bay against hunters, these two savages made common cause against the inhuman powers of antiquity. Brule again led the way back to the secret door. Silently, they entered, and silently they proceeded down the dim corridor, taking the opposite direction from that in which they had previously traversed it. After a while, the Pict stopped and pressed close to one of the secret doors, bidding Cull to look with him through the hidden slot. This opens up a little used stair, which leads to a corridor running past the study room door. They gazed, and presently, mounting the silent stair, came a silent shape. Two! Chief Counselor, exclaimed Cull, buying at him with bare dagger. How, what means this, Brule? Murder and foulest treachery, hissed Brule. Nay, as Cull would have flung the door aside and leapt forth, we are lost if you meet him here, for more luck at the foot of those stairs. Come. Half running, they darted back along the passage. Back through the secret door Brule led, shutting it carefully behind them, then across the chamber to an opening into a room seldom used. There he swept aside some tapestries in a dim corner nook and, drawing Cull with him, stepped behind them. Minutes dragged. Cull could hear the breeze in the other room blowing the window curtains about, and it seemed to him like the murmur of ghosts. Then through the door, stealthily, came two, Chief Counselor of the King. Evidently, he had come through the study room and, finding it empty, sought his victim where he was most likely to be. He came with an upraised dagger, walking silently. A moment he halted, gazing about the apparently empty room, which was lighted dimly by a single candle. Then he advanced cautiously, apparently at a loss to understand the absence of the king. He stood before the hiding place and slay, hissed the pick. Cull, with a single mighty leap, hurled himself into the room. Two spun, but the blinding, tigerish speed of the attack gave him no chance for defence or counterattack. Sword steel flashed in the dim light and grated on bone as two toppled backwards. Cull's sword standing out between his shoulders. Cull leaned above him, teeth bared in a killer's snarl, heavy brows a scowl above the eyes that were like the grey ice of the cold sea. Then he released the hilt and recoiled, shaken, dizzy, the hand of death at his spine. For as he watched, Two's face became strangely dim and unreal. The features mingled and merged in a seemingly impossible manner. Then, like a fading mask of fog, the face suddenly vanished, and in its stead gaped and leered a monstrous serpent's head. Falco, gasped Cull, sweat beating his forehead, and again, Falco. Brule leaned forward, face immobile, yet his glittering eyes mirrored something of Cull's horror. Regain your sword, Lord King, said he. There are yet deeds to be done. Hesitantly, Cull set his hand to the hilt. His flesh crawled as he set his foot upon the terror which lay at their feet. And as some jerk of muscular reaction caused the frightful mouth to gape suddenly, he recoiled, weak with nausea. Then, wrathful at himself, he plucked forth his sword and gazed more closely at the nameless thing that had been known as Two Chief Counselor. 
Save for the reptilian head, the thing was the exact counterpart of a man. A man with the head of a snake, Cull murmured. This then is a priest of the serpent god? Aye, Cull sleeps unknowing. These fiends can take any form they will. That is, they can. By a magic charm of the like, flung a web of sorcery about their faces as an actor dons a mask so that they resemble anyone they wish to. Then the old legends were true, mused the king. The grim old tales few dare even whisper, lest they die as blasphemers are no fantasies. By Valka, I thought I had guessed, but it seems beyond the bounds of reality. Ah, the guardsmen outside the door, they too are snake men. Hold, what would you do? Slay them, said Cull between his teeth. Strike at the skull, if at all, said Bro. Eighteen wait without the door, and perhaps a score more in the corridors. Hark ye, king, Canu learned of this plot. His spies have pierced the inmost fastness of the snake priests, and they brought hints of a plot. Long ago, he discovered the secret passageways of the palace, and at his command, I studied the map thereof, and came here by night to aid you, lest you die as other kings of Volusia have died. I came alone for the reason that to send more would have roused suspicion. Many could not steal into the palace as I did. Some of the full conspiracy you have seen. Snake men guard your door, and that one, as two, could pass anywhere else in the palace. In the morning, if the priests failed, the real guards would be holding their places again, knowing nothing, nothing remembering. They are to take the blame if the priests succeeded. But stay you here while I dispose of this carrion. So saying, the pick shouldered the frightful thing stolidly and vanished with it through another secret panel. Cull stood alone, his mind a whirl. Neophytes of the mighty serpent, how many lurked among his cities? How many tell the false from the true? Aye, how many of his trusted counsellors, his generals, were men? He could be certain of whom. The secret panel swung inward and Brul entered. You were swift. Aye. The warrior stepped forward, eyeing the floor. There is gore upon the rug. See. Cull bent forward. From the corner of his eye he saw a blur of movement, a glint of steel. Like a loosened bow, he whipped erect, thrusting upward. The warrior sagged upon the sword, his own clattering to the floor. Even at that instant, Cull reflected grimly that it was appropriate that the traitor should meet his death upon the sliding upward thrust used so much by his race. Then, as Brule slid from the sword to sprawl motionless on the floor, the face began to merge and fade. And as Cull caught his breath, his hair a prickle, the inhuman features vanished, and there were jaws of a great snake gaping hideously, the terrible beady eyes, venomous even in death. He was a snake priest all the time, gasped the king. Vaka, what an elaborate plan to throw me off my guard. Kanu there, is he a man? Was it Kanu to whom I talked in the gardens? Almighty Vaka. As his flesh crawled with a horrid thought, are the people of Velusia men, or are they all serpents? Undecided he stood, idly seeing that the thing named Brule no longer wore the dragon armlet. A sound made him wheel. Brule was coming through the secret door. Hold! Upon the arm upthrown to halt the king's hovering sword gleamed the dragon armlet. Volka! The pick stopped short, then a grim smile curled his lips. By the gods of the seas, these demons are crafty past reckoning, for it must be that one lurked in the corridors, and seeing me go, carrying the carcasses of that other, took my appearance. So, I have another to do away with. Hold. There was a menace of death in Cull's voice. I have seen two men turned to serpents before my eyes. How may I know if you are a true man? Bro laughed. <laughs> <laughs> For two reasons, King Cull. No snake man wears this, he indicated the dragon armlet. 
Nor can any say these words. And again, Cull heard the strange phrase. Kanama ka lajirama. Kanama ka lajirama. Cull repeated mechanically. Now, where in Balka's name have I heard that? I have not, and yet, and yet, I, you remember, Cull, said Bro. Through the dim corridors of memory, those words lurk, though you have never heard them in this life. Yet in bygone ages, they were so terribly impressed upon the soul mind that never dies, that they will always strike dim chords in your memory, though you be reincarnated for a million years to come. For that phrase has come secretly down the grim and bloody eons, since when, uncounted centuries ago, those words were watchwords for the race of men who battled with the grisly beings of the Elder Universe. For none but a real man of men may speak them, whose jaws and mouth are shaped differently from any other creature. Their meaning has been forgotten, but not the words themselves. True, said Cull. I remember the legends, Varko. He stopped short, staring, for suddenly, like the silent swinging wide of a mystic door, misty, unfathomed reaches opened in the recesses of his consciousness, and for an instant he seemed to gaze back through the vastness that spanned life and life, seeing through the vague and ghostly fogs dim shapes revealing dead centuries, men in combat with hideous monsters, vanquishing a planet of fearful terrors. Against a grey, ever-shifting background move strange nightmare forms, fantasies of lunacy and fear, and man, the jest of the gods, the blind, wisdomless striver from dust to dust, following the long, bloody trail of his destiny, knowing not why, bestial, blundering, like a great, murderous child, yet feeling somewhere a spark of divine fire. Cull drew a hand across his brow, shaken. These sudden glimpses into the abyss of memory always startled him. They are gone, said Bro, as if scanning his secret mind. The bird women, the harpies, the bat men, the flying fiends, the wolf people, the demons, the goblins, all save such as this being that lies at our feet, and a few of the wolf men. Long and terrible was the war, lasting through the bloody centuries, since first the first men risen from the mire of apedom turned upon those who then ruled the world. And that last mankind conquered, so long ago that not but dim legends come to us through the ages. The snake people were the last to go, yet at last men conquered, even them, and drove them forth into the wasteland of the world there to mate with true snakes until, some day, say the sages, the horrible breed shall vanish utterly. Yet the things returned in crafty guise as men grew soft and degenerate, forgotten ancient wars. Ah, that was a grim and secret war. Among the men of the younger earth stole the frightful monsters of the elder planet, safeguarded, by their horrid wisdom and mysticism, taking all forms and shapes, doing deeds of horror secretly. No man knew who was true man and who false. No man could trust any man. Yet by means of their own craft, they formed ways by which the false might be known from the true. Men took for a sign and a standard the figure of the flying dragon, the winged dinosaur, a monster of past ages, which was the greatest foe of the serpent. And men used those words, which I spoke to you, as a sign and symbol. For as I said, none but a true man can repeat them. So mankind triumphed. Yet again the fiends came, after the years of forgetfulness had gone by. For a man is still an ape, and that he forgets what is not ever before his eyes. As priests they came, and for that men in their luxury and might had by then lost faith in the old religions and worships. The snake men in the guise of teachers of a new and truer cult. 
built a monstrous religion about the worship of the serpent god. Such is their power that it is now death to repeat the old legends of the snake people, and people bow again to the serpent god in new form. And blind fools that they are, the great hosts of men see no connection between this power and the power men overthrew aeons ago. As priests, the snake men are content to rule, and yet... He stopped. Go on. Cull felt an unaccountable stirring of the short hair at the base of his scalp. Kings have reigned as two men in Volusia, the Pict whispered. And yet, slain in battle, have died serpents, as died he who fell beneath the spear of Lion Fang on the red beaches when we of the Isles harried the seven empires. And how can this be, Lord Cull? These kings were born of women and lived as men. This, the true kings died in secret, as you would have died tonight, and priests of the serpent reigned in their stead. No man knowing. Cull cursed between his teeth. Aye, it must be. No one has ever seen a priest of the serpent and lived. That is known. They live in utmost secrecy. The statecraft of the seven empires is a mazy, monstrous thing, said Brill. There the true men know that among them glide the spies of the serpent and the men who are the serpent's allies, such as Canub, Baron of Blal. And yet no man dare seek to unmask a suspect lest vengeance befall him. No man trusts his fellow and the true statesman dare not speak to each other what is in the minds of all. Could they be sure? Could a snake man or plot be unmasked before them all? Then would the power of the serpent be more than half broken. For all would then ally and make common cause, sifting out the traitors. Canu alone is of sufficient shrewdness and courage to cope with them. And even Canu learned only enough of their plot to tell me what would happen, what has happened up to this time. Thus far I was prepared. From now on, we must trust to our luck and our craft. Here and now, I think we are safe. Those snake men without the door dare not leave their post lest true men come here unexpectedly. But tomorrow, they will try something else, you may be sure. Just what they will do, none can say. Not even can who. But we must stay at each other's sides, King Cull, until we conquer, or both be dead. Now come with me while I take this carcass to the hiding place where I took the other being. Cull followed the Pict with his grisly burden through the secret tunnel and down the dim corridor. Their feet trained to the silence of the wilderness, made no sound. Like phantoms, they glided through the ghostly light, Cull wondering that the corridors should be deserted. At every turn, he expected to run full upon some frightful apparition. Suspicions surged back upon him. Was this pick leading him into an ambush? He fell back a pace or two behind Brule, his ready sword hovering at the pick's unheeding back. Brule should die first if he meant treachery. But if the Pict was aware of the king's suspicion, he showed no sign. Solidly, he tramped along until they came to a room, dusty and long unused, where mouldy tapestries hung heavy. Brule drew aside some of these and concealed the corpse behind them. Then they turned to retrace their steps, when suddenly Brule halted with such abruptness that he was closer to death than he knew, for Cull's nerves were on edge. Something's moving in the corridor, hissed the Pict. Canu says these ways would be empty, yet he drew his sword and stole into the corridor. Cull followed warily. A short way down the corridor, a strange, vague glow appeared, then came toward them. Nerves a-leap, they waited, backs to the corridor wall, for what they knew not, but Cull heard Brule's breath hiss through his teeth and was reassured as to Brule's loyalty. The glow merged into a shadowy form, a shape vaguely like a man it was, but misty and elusive, 
like a wisp of fog that grew more tangible as it approached, but never fully material. A face looked at them, a pair of luminous, great eyes that seemed to hold all the tortures of a million centuries. There was no menace in that face. With its dim, worn features, but only a great pity, and that face, that face. Almighty gods, breathed Cull, an icy hand at his soul. Elal, king of Volusia, who died a thousand years ago. Brill shrank back as far as he could, his narrow eyes widened in a blaze of pure horror, the sword shaking in his grip, unnerved for the first time that weird night. Erect and defiant stood Cull, instinctively holding his useless sword at the ready, flesh a crawl, hair a prickle, yet still a king of kings, as ready to challenge the powers of the unknown dead as the powers of the living. The phantom came straight on, giving them no heed. Cull shrank back as it passed them, feeling an icy breath like a breeze from the arctic snow. Straight on went the shape, with slow, silent footsteps as if the chains of all the ages were upon those vague feet, vanishing about a bend of the corridor. Oh, Volca, muttered the pick, wiping the cold beads from his brow. That was no man. That was a ghost. Aye, Cull shook his head wonderingly. Did you not recognise the face? That was a lal who reigned in Melusia a thousand years ago, and who was found hideously murdered in his throne room. The room now known as the Accursed Room. Have you not seen a statue in the famed Room of Kings? Yes, I remember the tale now. God's cull, that is another sign of the frightful and foul power of these snake priests. That king was slain by snake people, and thus his soul became their slave to do their bidding throughout eternity. For the sages have ever maintained that if a man is slain by a snake man, his ghost becomes their slave. A shudder shook Cull's gigantic frame. Valka, but what a fate. Hark ye. His fingers closed upon Brill's sinewy arm like steel. Hark ye if I am wounded unto death by these foul monsters. Swear that ye will smite me with your sword through my breast lest my soul be enslaved. I swear answered Brill, his fierce eyes lighting. And do ye the same by me, Cull? Their strong right hands met in a silent sealing of their bloody bargain. Chapter 4 Masks Cull sat upon his throne and gazed brutally, out upon the sea of faces turned towards him. A courtier was speaking in evenly modulated tones, but the king scarcely heard him. Close by, two, chief counsellor, stood ready at Cull's command, and each time the king looked at him, Cull shuddered inwardly. The surface of court life was as the unrippled surface of the sea between tide and tide. To the musing king, the affairs of the night before seemed as a dream until his eyes dropped to the arm of his throne. A brown, sinewy hand rested there, upon the wrist of which gleamed a dragon armlet. Brule stood beside his throne, and ever the Pict's fierce secret whisper brought him back from the realm of unreality in which he moved. No, that was no dream, that monstrous interlude. As he sat upon his throne in the Hall of Society and gazed upon the courtiers, the ladies, the lords, the statesmen. He seemed to see their faces as things of illusion, things unreal, existent only as shadows and mockeries of substance. Always he had seen their faces as masks, but before he had looked on them with contemptuous tolerance, thinking to see beneath the masks shallow, puny souls, avaricious, lustful, deceitful, now there was a grim undertone, a sinister meaning, a vague horror that lurked beneath the smooth masks. While he exchanged courtesies with some noblemen or counsellors, he seemed to see the smiling face fade like smoke and the frightful jaws of a serpent gaping there. How many of those he looked upon were horrid, inhuman monsters plotting his death beneath the smooth, mesmeric illusion of a human face. 
Volusia, land of dreams and nightmares, a kingdom of shadows ruled by phantoms who glided back and forth behind the painted curtains, mocking the futile king who sat upon the throne, himself a shadow. And like a comrade shadow, Brule stood by his side, dark eyes glittering from a mobile face. A real man, Brule and Cole felt his friendship for the savage become a thing of reality and sensed that Brule felt a friendship for him beyond the mere necessity of statecraft. And what, mused Cull, were the realities of life? Ambition? Power? Pride? The friendship of man? The love of woman? Which Cull had never known. Battle? Plunder? What? Was it the real Cull who sat upon the throne, or was it the real Cull who had scaled the cliffs of Atlantis, harried the far isles of the sunset, and laughed upon the green, roaring tides of the Atlantean sea? How could a man be so many different men in a lifetime? For Cull knew that there were many Culls, and he wondered which was the real Cull. After all, the priests of the serpent went a step further in their magic, for all men wore masks, and many a different mask with each different man or woman. And Cull wondered if a serpent did not lurk under every mask. So he sat and brooded in strange, mazy thought ways, and the courtiers came and went, and the minor affairs of the day were completed, until at last the king and Brule sat alone in the hall of society, save for the drowsy attendants. Cull felt a weariness. Neither he nor Brule had slept the night before, nor had Cull slept the night before that, when in the gardens of Kanu he had had his first hint of the weird things to be. Last night nothing further had occurred after they had returned to the study room from the secret corridors, but they had neither dared nor cared to sleep. Cull, with the incredible vitality of a wolf, had aforetime gone for days without sleep, in his wild savage days but now his mind was edged from constant thinking and from the nerve-breaking eeriness of the past night. He needed sleep, but sleep was furthest from his mind. And he would not have dared sleep if he had thought of it. Another thing that had shaken him was the fact that though he and Brule had kept a close watch to see if or when the study room guard was changed, yet it was changed without their knowledge. For the next morning, those who stood on guard were able to repeat the magic words of Brule but they remembered nothing out of the ordinary. They thought they had stood at guard all night, as usual, and Cull said nothing to the contrary. He believed them true men, but Brill had advised absolute secrecy, and Cull also thought it best. Now Brill leaned over the throne, lowering his voice so not even a lazy attendant could hear. They will strike soon, I think, Cull. A while ago, Kanu gave me a secret sign. The priest knows that we know their plot. Of course, but they know not how much we know. We must be ready for any sort of action. Kanu and the Pictish chiefs will remain within hailing distance now until this is settled, one way or another. Ha, uh, Cull, if it comes to a pitched battle, the streets and the castles of Volusia will run red. Cull smiled grimly. He would greet any sort of action with a ferocious joy. This wandering in a labyrinth of illusion and magic was extremely irksome to his nature. He longed for the leap and clang of swords, for the joyous freedom of battle. Then into the hall of society came two again, and the rest of the councillors. Lord King, the hour of the council is at hand, and we stand ready to escort you to the council room. Cull rose, and the councillors bent the knee as he passed through the way opened by them for his passage, rising behind him and following. Eyebrows were raised as the pick strode defiantly behind the king, but no one dissented. Brule's challenging gaze swept the smooth faces of the councillors with the defiance of an intruding savage. The group passed through the halls, and came at last to the council chamber. The door was closed as usual, and the councillors arranged themselves in the order of their rank before the dais upon which stood the king. Like a bronze statue, Brule took up his stand behind Cull. Cull swept the room with a swift stare. Surely no chance of treachery here. Seventeen councillors there were, all known to him. All of them had espoused his cause when he ascended the throne. Men of Valusia, he began in the conventional manner, then halted, perplexed. The councillors had risen as a man and were moving towards him. 
There was no hostility in their looks, but their actions were strange for a council room. The foremost was close to him when Brill sprang forward, crouched like a leopard. Kanamakal Ajirama! His voice crackled through the sinister silence of the room, and the foremost councillor recoiled, hand flashing to his robes like a spring released. Brull moved, and the man pitched headlong and lay still, while his face faded and became the head of a mighty snake. Slay call, rasped the pick's voice. They be all serpent men. The rest was a scarlet maze. Cull saw the familiar faces dim like fading fog and in their places gaped horrid reptilian visages as the whole band rushed forward. His mind was dazed but his giant body faltered not. The singing of a sword filled the room and the onrushing flood broke in a red wave but they surged forward again seemingly willing to fling their lives away in order to drag down the king. Hideous jaws gaped at him, terrible eyes blazed into his unblinkingly, a frightful fetid scent pervaded the atmosphere, the serpent scent that Cull had known in southern jungles. Swords and daggers leapt at him and he was dimly aware that they wounded him, but Cull was in his element. Never before had he faced such grim foes, but it mattered little. They lived, their veins held blood that could be spilt, and they died when his great sword cleft their skulls or drove through their bodies. Slash, thrust, thrust and swing, yet had Cull died there but for the man who crouched at his side, parrying and thrusting, for the king was clear berserk, fighting in the terrible Atlantean way that seeks death to deal death. He made no effort to avoid thrusts and slashes, standing straight up and ever plunging forward, no thought in his frenzied mind but to slay. Not often did Cull forget his fighting craft and his primitive fury, but now some chain had broken in his soul, flooding his mind with a red wave of slaughter lust. He slew a foe at each blow, but they surged about him, and time and again Brule turned a thrust that would have slain as he crouched beside Cull, parrying and warding with cold steel, slaying not as Cull slew with long slashes and plunges, but with short overhand blows and upward thrusts. Cull laughed, a laugh of insanity. <laughs> the fretful faces swirled about him in a scarlet blaze. He felt steel sink into his arm and dropped his sword in a flashing arc that cleft his foe to the breastbone. Then the mists faded and the king saw that he and Brule stood alone above a sprawl of hideous crimson figures who lay still <sighs> upon the floor. Volka, what a killing, said Brule, shaking the blood from his eyes. Cull... Had these been warriors who knew how to use steel, we had died here. These serpent priests know naught of swordcraft and die easier than any men I ever slew. Yet had there been a few more, I think the matter had ended otherwise. Cull nodded. The wild berserker blaze had passed, leaving a mazed feeling of great weariness. Blood seeped from wounds on breast, shoulder, arm and leg. Brill himself, bleeding from a score of flesh wounds, glanced at him in some concern. Lord Cull, let us hasten to have your wounds dressed by the women. Cull thrust him aside with a drunken sweep of his mighty arm. Nay, we'll see this through ere we cease. Go you, though, and have your wounds seen to. I command it. The pipe laughed grimly. <laughs> your wounds are more than mine, Lord King, he began, and then stopped as a sudden thought struck him. My Valka, Cull, this is not the council room. Cull looked about and suddenly other fogs seemed to fade. Nay, this is the room where Elal died a thousand years ago, since unused and named accursed. Then by gods they've tricked us after all, exclaimed Brule in a fury, kicking the corpses at their feet. They caused us to walk like fools into their ambush. By their magic they changed the appearance of all. Then there is further devilry afoot said Cull, for if there be true men in the councils of Veluza, they should be in the real council room now. Come swiftly. And leaving the room with its ghastly keepers, they hastened through the halls that seemed deserted until they came to the real council room. Then Cull halted with a ghastly shudder. From the council room sounded a voice speaking, and the voice was his. With a hand that shook, he parted the tapestries and gazed into the room. There sat the councillors, Counterparts of the men he and Brule had just slain, and upon the dais stood Cull, king of Volusia. He stepped back, his mind reeling. This is insanity, 
he whispered. Am I, am I Cull? Do I stand here or is that Cull yonder in very truth? A red am I but a shadow. A figment of thought? Brill's hand clutching his shoulder, shaking him fiercely, brought him to his senses. Falca's name be not a fool. Can you yet be astounded after all we have seen? See you not that those are true men, bewitched by a snake man who has taken your form, as those others took their forms. By now you should have been slain, and yon monster reigning in your stead, unknown by those bowed to you. Leap amid, slay swiftly or else we are undone. The Red Slayers, true men, stand close on each hand and none but you can reach and slay him. Be swift. Cull shook off the onrushing dizziness, flung back his head in the old, defiant gesture. He took a long, deep breath, as does a strong swimmer before diving into the sea. Then, sweeping back the tapestries, made the dais in a single, lion-like bound. Brul had spoken truly. There stood men of the Red Slavers, guardsmen trained to move quick as the striking leopard. Any but Cull had died there ere he could reach the usurper. But the sight of Cull, identical with the man upon the dais, held them in their tracks. Their minds stunned for an instant, and that was long enough. He upon the dais snatched for his sword, but even as his fingers closed upon the hilt, Cull's sword stood out behind his shoulders, and the thing that men had thought the king pitched forward from the dais to lie silent upon the floor. Hold! Cull's lifted hand and kingly voice stopped the rush that he had started, and while they stood, astounded, he pointed to the thing which lay before them, whose face was fading into that of a snake. They recoiled, and from one door came Brul, and from another came Kanu. These grasped the king's bloody hand, and Kanu spoke. Men of Valusia, you are seen with your own eyes. This is the true Cull. The mightiest king to whom Valusia has ever bowed. The power of the serpent is broken, and ye be all true men. King Cull, have you commands? Lift that carrion, said Cull, and men of the guard took up the thing. Now follow me, said the king, and he made his way to the accursed room. Brule, with a look of concern, offered the support of his arm, but Cull shook him off. The distance seemed endless to the bleeding king, but at last he stood at the door and laughed fiercely and grimly when he heard the horrified ejaculations of the councillors. At his orders, the guardsmen flung the corpse they carried beside the others, and motioning all from the room, Cull stepped out last and closed the door. A wave of dizziness left him shaken. The faces turned to him, pallid and wonderingly, swirled and mingled in a ghostly fog. He felt the blood from his wound trickling down his limbs, and he knew that which he was to do he must do quickly, or not at all. His sword rasped from its sheath. Brul, are you there? Aye. Brul's face looked at him through the mist, close to his shoulder, but Brul's voice sounded leagues and eons away. Remember our vow, Brul, and now bid them stand back. His left arm cleared a space as he flung up his sword. Then, with all his waning power, he drove it through the door into the jam, driving the great sword to the hilt and sealing the room forever. Legs braced wide, he swayed drunkenly, facing the horrified councillors. Let this room be doubly accursed, and let those rotting skeletons lie there forever, as a sign of the dying might of the serpent. Here I swear that I shall hunt the serpent men from land to land, from sea to sea, giving no rest until all be slain, that good triumph and the power of hell be broken. This thing I swear, I, Cull, King of Felusia. His knees buckled as the faces swayed and swirled. The councillors leapt forward, but ere they could reach him, Cull slumped to the floor and lay still, face upward. The councillors surged about the fallen king, Chattering and shrieking, Kanu beat them back with his clenched fist, cursing savagely. Back! Back, you fools! Would you stifle the little life he has yet in him? How, bro? Is he dead or will he live? To the warrior who bent above the prostrate cull. <laughs> dead, sneered bro irritably. Such a man as this is not so easily killed. Lack of sleep and loss of blood have weakened him, Baralka. He has a score of deep wounds. 
but none of them mortal. Yet have those gibbering fools bring the court women here at once. Brule's eyes lighted with a fierce, proud light. Canu, Valka Canu, but here is such a man as I knew not existed in these degenerate days. He will be in the saddle in a few scant days, and then may the serpent men of the world beware of Cull of Volusia. Valka, but that will be a rare hunt. Ah, I see long years of prosperity for the world, with such a king upon the throne of Volusia. Thank you for listening. For updates, follow our Facebook page below. Please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.